Hello and welcome. My name is Harlequin Grimm, and this is another episode of Mania, a place where phantoms, ghouls, vampires, murderers, and all manner of antagonists get to bathe in the spotlight of history's most mystifying and horrible events. For this particular story, we are taking several long strides back from our previous episode's location. We are going to a time where countless kings and queens reigned, but when only one true ruler rose above all others. hath no fury, like the Black Plague. Knowledge of the disease is all but ubiquitous. I'm sure that when we were all in middle school, when all the other lessons about the medieval era were slipping from our prepubescent unconscious, stories of the untold nightmares spawned by the disease remained. The Black Plague, also known as the Black Death, is a bacterial infection, presenting itself in three major forms. There's the bubonic, the septicemic, and the pneumonic plague, each have their unique forms of spreading and their respective points of fatality. Sort of like, um, gummy candy. You know, it's all the same source, it just looks and tastes different, so think of the plague as a kind of death candy shop with only a few varieties. Pneumonic plague, for example, is the most infectious and is considered an advanced stage of the bubonic. It is passed directly through droplets made airborne through coughing. Lovely. The septicemic form, however, is my favorite, because it is known to be fatal within a mere one to three days after being contracted. The plague began its reign in the 1340s, reaping an estimated 25 million people, or a third of Europe's population. However you like to take that specific cup of tea. Keep in mind, records from that time are so fragmentary that to offer up an accurate estimation is really difficult. But one thing is for certain, once a plague sinks its teeth into a heavily populated city, it won't let go until it takes a significant portion of the population back in its jaws. Plagues linger for centuries, and they'll spark like fires from the smallest of embers if they're not stamped out quickly. What most people don't know from the history books is that several centuries later, the same plague took 12 million lives in China during the mid-1800s. Just as well, the Great Plague of London occurred in 1665-66. to 66. So, in only one year, one in five residents perished. And for some select towns and villages, the figures would not be one-fifth or one-third, but rather 70% of the population. The Black Plague was the cruelest sovereign of Europe during its reign. And as a cruel irony, the only force which would look upon all people equally during a time when feudal systems thrived was death herself. Of course, as romantic as all this is getting, we mustn't linger in the abstract realms too long, however warm and cuddly it's been so far. Let's narrow it down. Our story takes us just a half hour train ride from Prague. In those times, it would be a horse or a wagon, and several days instead. The year was 1142, and near the town Kutnahora in the Czech Republic, a Cistercian monastery was being founded. The life of the monks in the abbey was humble their principal tasks being the cultivation of the abbey grounds. This monastery would come to birth one of the most artistic celebrations of death, the Sedlec Ossuary, located beneath the cemetery church of All Saints, built 200 years later. For those who aren't learned in the vocabulary of undertakers, which is understandable, I suppose, an ossuary is a container, or in this case, a room, where human remains are kept primarily bones. 
Of course, it would take a bit of misfortune, ill-timing, and a few heavy handfuls of tragedy to bring this humble ossuary into the state of infamy it enjoys today. Jumping to 1278, King Otokar II of Bohemia sent one of the abbots of Sedlec, a man named Henry, on a diplomatic mission to the Holy Land. When Henry returned, he brought with him something precious. And why the only historical fragment of this man's existence is the name Henry, I cannot really be certain. I mean, why wasn't he called Zeke the Harbinger of Sacraments, or Abfellow the Hollowed Monk? Henry? Really? That's what we have? Henry. Alright. Now, remember, during the medieval era, a little pilgrimage like this was no small feat. Henry couldn't hop on the nearest airline and enjoy a bag of pretzels while he made his way to the Holy Land. What returned with his heroic efforts was something befitting the challenges of his travels, and its effects on the Sedlec Monastery would reflect that in unheard heights of grim fame. What Henry brought back with him was... dirt. Literally dirt. More specifically, dirt from Golgotha. For those out of the religious loop, Golgotha is said to be the crucifixion site of Jesus of Nazareth. And if you are still out of the loop at this point, I, I'm not really sure what to do with you. You might just have to give me the benefit of the doubt here. In any case, as it turns out, dirt can do quite a bit in altering history. It shook the fate of that tiny Sedlec Abbey. And once word of this pious act spread, it gathered fame throughout Central Europe, so much so that countless wealthy and powerful individuals sought to be buried there. Over a handful of dirt, you might be thinking. Well, in those times, burial sites became a point of obsession for many people in the medieval age. It represented a gate from one state of existence to another. And it was really for the dead more than for the living. Although many of us still nurse reservations regarding the states of our souls after we die. In those times, our ancestors took that fear to pinnacles of paranoia, going so far as to travel many, many miles to have their loved ones buried in a specific plot of consecrated ground. And with those mysterious forces working so hard above and below us, it isn't always so simple either. One burial place may not be as holy as the next. I mean, why settle for that plot of land your local priest blessed when you can rest your bones in the soil graced by the dirt from Golgotha itself? There's no real competition. Is this starting to make sense? For the Sedlec Cemetery, this was all fine and well. A little prosperity was not a bad thing for an abbey full of humble and poor monks. Until, of course, the Black Death came knocking. With the Sedlec Abbey now having one of the most enviable burial sites in all of Europe, and the Black Death running rampant, the cemetery had to expand to accommodate for the bodies it was housing. During the peak of the Black Death's rampage, the abbey was not only struggling to maintain the lives of its monks, but it was facing the challenge of accommodating literally thousands of departed. During 1344, the head of the abbey at the time was Abbot Hedrick. At this moment, he was watching an early midwinter sunset spread out across the stretching fields surrounding the abbey. Despite being but a walk away, Kutnahora's sleepy stirrings contained a life so foreign to his, one of dutiful contemplation. Unlike many others, fear for the Black Death had not infected his heart. His faith, what had always kept him resolute, kept him irreverent of the disease, even on a day like today, after ushering another handful of monks into their graves. A familiar rhythm of shuffling feet approached Hedrick. The abbot stepped back into the abbey, barring the door behind him. Nobody should leave past nightfall, not with those kinds of winds stirring the air, nor the storm clouds foreboding more sweeping sheets of icy rainfall. Abbot, a meek voice, said beneath a cowl, Yes, Brother Rint, Hedrick replied, 
looking down upon the folds of robes hiding the monk's malnourished body. What word have you brought back from town? The same word that we have always received, and that word is faith, the abbot replied. Is that all you've come to ask? You mean to say we will not be receiving the town's tithes? Kutna cannot afford the tithes this week, nor the next, I'm sure. We will have to make do with the donations. Everybody is struggling. The rains, the rot, the rampant disease. These are biblical times, Brother Rint, and we must act accordingly. Are the tithes not immutable? Rint asked. They are of a command higher than our own. Not, the abbot replied harshly, when that higher command would see the townspeople starve. Will you be the one tilling their fields once they've starved? Will you assist them in milking their livestock, milling their grain, and stretching out supplies to see them through the times? Brother Rint shuffled backwards, inching for the hallway. Then I would suggest, the abbot continued, tending to your own duties. Or, Hedrick placed a hand on the monk's shoulder, follow me. I have a task for you. The stench hit like a hammer. Then it clouded, stifled, made the eyes water and the insides twist. But vomiting was no large concern. There was quite little in their stomachs to begin with. Hedrick stepped slowly through the dark mounds in the underground chamber, alighting torches resting in sconces. As the abbot went to the farthest corner of the ossuary to light the final remaining torch, Rint's eyes widened. It was as if his vision was protecting him. The mounds writhed with details between the shadows deepened from the torchlight. Then he would make sense of it. Femurs, shoulder blades, ribs, ankles, and even hands, stretching out through piles of the deceased like ornaments in a shop of antiquities. This is your task, Hedrick said. Since you seem so concerned to make yourself useful, I am certain you will find no burden in tending to the remains of the humble, the meek, the departed. I is Brother Pavel not in charge of our ossuary, Abbot? Rint asked, feeling rather small before the task before him, feeling rather queasy, thinking about how his body might get used to the stench of death, the air thickened from the incense of corroding bone. Brother Pavel passed away yesterday, Master Rint, while you were away. His remains were inducted into the plots of our cemetery, one of the last remaining. Such is why I've brought you here. Master, Rint asked in confusion, welcome to your new profession. The demands for burial space from people of higher stature are simply too much of an opportunity to ignore. We are exhuming the remains from any unmarked graves, particularly those fallen to the plague, and moving them here. I don't see how this at all involves me, Abbot. It does not, or rather, didn't, the abbot replied. Each pile is a cluster of bodies, often of familial relation. Organize them, reassemble them, and duck them into the slots provided in the walls. There are coffins, should you deem them necessary, but don't use too many. We will need them for other mm, visitors. Rint nodded numbly. It was just then, as Hedrick's footsteps began to recede from the damp chamber, that Rint caught a glimpse of the farthest wall in the back. The way the torchlight licked up the sides suggested that the catacombs didn't end in the single stretch of space. Rather, it extended outwards into hallways on either side. Each yard of floor was as cramped as the next, cluttered with untidy remains. Careless heaps upended from wheelbarrows, stretching outwards and twisting back in. A maze of stonework, damned to be insufficient, for the very purpose of its creation. Weeks passed. The war that the plague was determined to wage roared on. More bodies flooded into the Sedlec Abbey. Construction to expand the cemetery continued. All the while, any graves holding the remains of those who could not pay their way into heaven were abolished, their bones sent down to Master Rint. What was once considered a punishment by Abbot Hedrick was no longer so. One evening, when the abbot descended down into the ossuary with a handful of monks, delivering another wheelbarrow full of half-decomposed corpses, the abbot was surprised to see Rint at the end of the room he'd introduced to him just weeks before. Only now, 
Its floors were almost entirely clean. The bones had been allocated to coffins, or into niches in the wall, or crafted, of all things. The room, to all of their amusement, was furnished. There were chairs, candle holders, small tables, and even the workings of a chandelier. Only, it wasn't wood or metal that comprised these objects, but the absolute deluge of materials Master Rint had on hand. Bones. Mm, Master Rint, one of the brothers asked. The small monk, seemingly lost in the world of bones, carving tools, and twine twirling between his delicate fingers, remained unperturbed by the intrusion upon his work. Through the open hatch of the ossuary, Rint could hear the roar of rainfall against the chapel, the sound of the stained glass windows beating back the downpour, each crack of lightning seemingly threatening to shatter the entire structure. If it did, it would bring down with it his intricate realm of being puppeteer and craftsman, with the plague's tossed-aside playthings called humans. Once this thought crossed his mind, only then did he look up from his current project. Hedrick stepped between the monks and overlooked Rint's handiwork. The several candelabras, comprised of the bones of forearms, fingers, and sockets, caught his attention firstly. Just how clean the bones were was what was most surprising. Rint struggled to maintain eye contact with the abbot as his eyes swept over his creations. Jerked from his meditation upon the organization of remains, he remembered his hunger his stomach vocalized this with a long growl that echoed throughout the catacombs. It seemed at once to say less about Rint and more about the thousands of bones which had passed under his fingertips. The growl of the dead, it seemed, starved of attention, prayers, and blessings. Well done, Abbot Hedrick said. The two monks behind him took in sharp inhalations of surprise. Abbot, one of them murmured uneasily. This is sacrilege. The abbot turned to them and said, Because the poor are plundered and the needy grown, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will protect them from those who malign them. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 5. Think carefully before you judge others, Brother Victor. Rint's work here is not sacrilege, but a blessing. At this, Hedrick knelt down, inspecting the sturdy pieces. Timidly, Rint offered up one of the candelabra, the bones were old, but polished. Rint had used the edge of the knife to scrape away any residue. A chapel should never go without light, Rint offered. Hedrick took up the candelabra and extended it out to Brother Victor. Take this and have the others put it up in the chapel at once, he ordered. After the others had left, Hedrick stood over Rint, watching him work. The ossuary was much tidier now. Relieved of its collection of candle holders and small tables, much needed in the rooms of the chapel just upstairs. What inspired you, Master Rint? the abbot asked. Was it God? No, abbot, Rint whispered. It was death. As the months wore on, the plague's death tolls reached an apex. Rint's work became more important than ever, as his careful reworkings of bones allowed for more space in the ossuary. In many ways, he was the caretaker of the unmarked, unhallowed, and uncared for. His hands would give attention to those lost to the sweeping, fatal arcs of the plague, attention that nobody else had time nor energy to sacrifice. But his work was a deliberate one, a hungry one. Like many others, Master Rint was beginning to endure hunger pangs which affected his judgment. Were it not for his almost trance-like work in the catacombs, he would have surely lost his mind. Many above ground were experiencing the effects of starvation, the sudden dropping away of sound judgment, the urges, the strange instincts. 
one night, as Rint toiled away in the catacombs, unable to sleep for the pain in his stomach, the door leading inside creaked open. Abbot Hedrick, Rint asked of the silhouettes entering, I is that you? But they came without torches, and their heads were drawn a little too far over their faces. Still, Rint recognized one of them as Brother Victor. He was the one who chanced upon his work before it had become popular amongst other monks in the abbey. Without warning, the two descended on Rint, one with rope to bind and restrain him, another with a cudgel to end him swiftly. Scrambling backwards, Rint fell upon one of his creations, reaching out for it blindly before throwing it. The heavy structure of bones exploded upon impact, giving him a moment to collect himself. The craftsman then dove for a skinny knife he used to clean the bones with and turned on his attackers. The exchange was swift, a retaliation that surprised even Rint after the bodies had fallen to the ground in their own heaps, the thick cloth of their robes lapping up the blood easily, as if hunger had made their bodies contain only a pithy amount of it. Rint opened his mouth to shout for Abbot Hedrick. Surely, if the abbot found him while the bodies were warm and the evidence obvious, any suspicions would be cleared. Then again, Rint stopped himself before the scream could escape his mouth. Instead, he tiptoed up to the door of the ossuary and craned his head to listen. There was nothing but the sound of rain beating against the chapel. No shuffling feet or even quiet murmurs nor any candles burning throughout the sacred space, its aroma of incense and clean air now a little too rich for Master Rint's tastes. After gathering a small mound of firewood, Rint returned to the ossuary and shut the door behind him. There was a long night's work ahead of him, but with enough careful planning and cleaning, several meals out of it as well. That part would be most natural. He would have to clean the bones, as always. Who's to say where the flesh went? After all, Rint was only doing as he was told, organizing the remains. When Hedrick visited Rint several days later, all was well with the monk who seemed to spend more and more of his waking hours with the dead rather than the living. Only, his work seemed invigorated, and there was a healthy glow about the monk's expression despite his many hours indoors. It was strange, because Abbot Hedrick wasn't giving him any more rations than he was allowing the others. The abbot decided against complimenting Rint on his unusually lively demeanor, as it really unsettled him more than anything. The two spoke of the monks that had gone missing several days before. It was not unnatural. With the plague digging its fingers into the population of the chapel, like many others across Europe, it was not uncommon to become convinced by the notion that to run away from one's home was to run away from death itself. Many fled from their towns, villages, and cities, hoping to outrun the floods, the disease, and the rampant tragedy devouring all. It's not so odd, Rint said to Hedrick, as they lifted up his masterpiece, an intricate chandelier with at least a dozen human skulls punctuating the descending tears of ivory. Brother Victor always struggled with his faith, Abbot. A tired smile came to Hedrick's lips. Together, the two of them hefted up the massive piece through the ossuary. Rint grimaced as they managed to get it through the door without any of the parts snapping loose. Where do you think they ran off to? Hedrick asked, once they were in the middle of the chapel. Who's to say? Master Rint replied. Of course, he knew exactly where they were. They were there, being hoisted up to hang as the centerpiece of the chapel. Well, pieces of them, at least. So this is the section of the podcast where I discuss what was real and what wasn't. If you haven't caught on already, Mania is a place I go to to dissect monsters. And every monster has a core of truth to it, a historical event that marks their birth. So I'll find strange and mysterious events 
events that don't really have an A to B narrative that is very clear. And I'll piece things together. Of course, to piece things together, unless I want to actually go on a voyage myself to these places and dig out the remnants of history that everyone else forgot, I have to put in some fiction. And that's where you get the narrative from. So, this is the section where I discuss just exactly that. What was real and what wasn't. So let's start with the location and the history. Well, the Black Plague was very real. The tolls of death were very real. The numbers were not exaggerated in the slightest. And the location was entirely real. It's actually a really remarkable story to think about it, that somebody's handful of dirt could change a history of a little cemetery to such an extent that it did. So that was very real, and that was perhaps the most surprising part. Uh, the, the number of bodies flooding into that cemetery to be buried was, was also very real. What was fake and what was very, very liberally changed was the timelines. So Abbot Hedrick was the founder of the cemetery. However, uh, not the founder of the cemetery, rather the founder of the abbey. Uh, apologies. And, and then so the character Master Rint was a woodcarver in the 18 and 1900s who was hired to do exactly what he did in the story, which was piece together bones and make these, these wonderful masterpieces. I don't know who he talked to to get this ad- agreement to mess with the remains of hundreds of people and make furniture out of them, but it was completely legal and agreed upon from what I, from what I read. And it really helped turn that place into a tourist destination in the modern day. Of course, it had no problem with that in the past. What with that little handful of dirt? So, Hedrick was around during the late 1200s, and Master Rint was around during the late 1800s. What I did is I put them together to sort of of explore the development of a person who goes from being a humble monk to a cannibalistic bone-carving maniac. Or, not maniac, but artist, I suppose. And really, the idea of somebody who spends time with bones, putting them together, it was just too much of a good idea to make him an innocent person. Because the the real story of of Master Rint, the woodcarver, in the late 1800s, doing this all under the watchful guise of the people asking him to do it, it's just, yeah, yeah, it's just what a waste, you know? What a waste. So I made him somebody who wasn't necessarily told to do this, and it just seemed to me far more interesting. Somebody who thought, oh, well, you told me to organize hundreds of bones. I'll do it my way. And so the development of Brother Victor being somebody who gives him the excuse to not only commit cannibalism because he had to kill them in self-defense, but to uh, hide their bodies in his most favorite art form. That was just, it seemed like a natural detail to me. It really topped off the character of Rint because he's somebody who kind of just tumbles into this task and falls in love with it in his own weird way it's sort of his escape from the plague surrounding him and everyone else yeah it's not exactly the most fun thing to imagine what life was like back then but somehow in my mind it's not that much of a stretch to imagine this going the way it did so that just about wraps it up for the entire episode If you'd like to support Mania, there are really many things you could do. Uh, You could interact with me, criticize me, tell me what you enjoy, what you don't, what I could work on, tell me any blips and quality. I'm sure I'm still getting the hang of all of this. Um, But when it comes to more direct support, you could leave ratings and reviews on iTunes to help spread the word. You could tell your friends, your family, you could... Put it on in the car while you're going for a long ride, while you have many people listening, and make sure you tell them my name several times. If you want to support it monetarily, you can go onto my website, and soon I will have a support page on harlequingrim.com, and there you can push forward some monetary support, and that really just helps give me time to focus on these projects, to edit them, and to do everything else that I do as a writer, which frees me up to master these projects really 
But most importantly, I just have to thank you for listening. It's so much fun to do this, and I truly enjoy interacting with people. It's by far one of the most exciting things that I've done so far. People seem to just be so encouraging and so loving so far about supporting this project. So thank you very much for listening, and I will see you next time.